Do you want to play some old resonator guitars, but maybe you're not sure of all the pitfalls that there can be? Let us guide you. Hi everybody, it's Martin from the Washboard Resonators and on this video we're going to look at a guide to buying old nationals. Now this video has come about because um, about a week or so ago, a young chap in the south of England called, called Toby got in touch to ask advice on buying an old resonator and he wanted a 1931 National Trillion and I found him one and here it is and here is mine. Now, Toby asked me a question. He asked me many questions, but one of his questions was, is it possible to have an old, all original national that is actually playable? It, there are so many complex issues to answering that question. Uh, I thought it was time I made a video to help you buy old nationals. Um, so what we'll do, I've got probably five, six, seven main points that we'll look at shortly. I'm also going to compare these two guitars and, and you can see which one you think sounds the best. We'll talk about some of the, um, the changes that happen to keep these guitars running. And all in all, I think this should help you. You know, if you're somebody who's getting into these or maybe you've been to them a while, you know what? You should be able to get something from this video which helps you as you go forward on choosing the right guitar or hopefully paying the right amount, or also just managing your expectations on what is possible. So I'm filming this in 2022, and the first Nationals came out of the factory in about 1926. So we're coming up for, for the early ones being 100 years old. Um, like if you get into, into driving classic cars versus a new, more modern car, if you want to hop into the, you know, jump in a car, switch it on, go to the shops, not really think about it, a new car is obviously the best. If you want to drive around in, in town in style in some old Cadillac or a super cool model, a Ford or whatever it might be, you're going to get that amazing experience and, and the smell of the olden days. But it's not something you can just, you know, jump, you know, jump into and go. It, it's going to need so much more maintenance and so much more money spending. Or it's got to be something that you can actually fix and repair to keep going yourself. You've got to love that kind of idiosyncrasy of the olden days. Well, these guitars are no different. As I said to Toby, tuners wear out, necks bend, cones fatigue and sag, bodies split, they can be won back, but sometimes it's at a cost of originality. So before I hit the seven points that should help you um, buy an old resonator guitar, do go and subscribe, click the bell icon, um, do leave a comment. This all helps massively. The biggest way of supporting the washboard resonators, which is me and Jack, is to go down into the, uh, the description and join the mailing list on the link there or find our music. But if you join the mailing list, we'll just tell you when we're gigging, when we've got new music coming out. You know, we play 20s, 30s, 40s kind of blues, jazz and swing. We use resonators, we love them. We'd love to share that with you. So I've got these seven points to get through and I've got some notes. Um, the first thing really is price. If you're looking to buy, the price should sort of affect things and you shouldn't, you've got to be really careful. So one of um, Toby's questions was about, he found a guitar that was all original and the dealer was asking top, 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 top money for it. And my first point to Toby was, if you buy something that's completely clean and completely original, and pay top money for it, that's fantastic. But you may then get, you know, it may arrive at your house and you'll find that the, the strings are off the fretboard, the intonation is all out, the cone, you know, when you play it, it just sounds like a rubbery banjo. Um, the neck's all warped and twisted because it sat in a case for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, just going out of shape and changing. And you might find yourself with a very expensive repair bill and parts need changing, it's not original anymore, if you want to play it. If you want to just collect it and keep it under the bed and use it as like stocks and shares, then go all original, of course. Um, and this is the, the, a big problem with resonator guitars. It's, it's about originality versus playability. So one of the first things I look for, really, if I'm buying an old resonator guitar, I like to have mine. I collect them, 
but I look for ones that I would not be afraid to play or record and 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 actually enjoy using fully. I want the strings to to you know to be in a good place. I want the guitar to fret well and intonate well. So one of the first questions really for me is if I'm buying one is has it been worked on in say the last 10 to 20 years by one of the main experts. So in Britain where I am there's Steve Evans at Beltona Instruments who used to work for Mark Knopfler and builds some of the world's great uh, resonator guitars. He's about 20 minutes away. You know, he does a lot of re rebuilds on these old ones. He did this one. He, he's done some of my other ones. Um, so if somebody offers me a guitar, has it been worked on? So Steve in England, um, Dave, has Dave King worked on it in England? Um, in Europe, has Mike Lewis worked on it? In America, I'd be asking, has Mark Schoenberg worked on it? If that was the case, then I know I'm going to get a guitar that's going to play really, really well and have had its issues sorted out. And I'd say that's for about the last, if it's been worked on in about the last 10, 20 years. That's really my first point. Because if that's been done, good. I know I can, if I'm happy with the price, I can buy the guitar and I know I can take it home, get out the case, and it should be basically fine. Or as fine as these things can be. I mean, I did do a video about the intonation of these things, and it's a very complex subject. I might put a link below, actually, in the, in the, the description. Um, but as, as well as these things can be, it should be okay. Now, if it hasn't been worked on with, with, by those people, I might be able to go and try the guitar. I might be able to check the intonation, check the playability. There's some other issues that are coming up later, which I'll flag for you to look out for. But um, if that work hasn't been done, really you want to be t subtracting that money from the price that you pay. Because the reality is, if that work hasn't been done, it's probably going to need doing. Maybe not this year, but maybe in five years or ten years. So, um, yeah, if, if, say, a guitar like one of these, these trillions now seem to be hitting around the, um, you know, the £4,000 mark, the £3,500 mark, which is about $4,500. Well, the cost of rebuilding, I think I spent about £450, so about $600-odd rebuilding this. Um, a little bit more on my Trojan, because I had some other work done on it, pickup fitted. Yeah, we're talking five to a thousand dollars, five hundred to a thousand dollars worth of work by somebody who knows what they're doing. So yeah, not just taking it to your local guy that sets up Stratocasters all day every day. I mean a real resonator expert that understands these, because a lot of people butcher these, and we don't want that. So number two, now, let's now just look at next specifically. Um, one of the things about old nationals that haven't been worked on is the necks very much go out of whack. So from about 1927 to about 1934, the necks on, on a lot of them, they're either maple or mahogany. Often the fretboards are dyed black maple. So they, they, dyed, they dyed maple, which was very cheap wood back in the day, black, put that on to look like ebony or a bit like rosewood. But the reality is, is that that dye used to react with the fret, uh, with the maple fretboard, and they can sort of chip and crack, and the necks can lose a lot of their stability. So if I ever see an old national that says one of these things where it comes up on eBay or it comes up somewhere, or people email me sometimes with things they've found in attics, almost without doubt, if it's not been touched and worked on, or even played for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the necks are in a really bad state. So, and what happens of course is with any kind of guitar is that the neck will basically do this over time and the strings come off the fretboard. Um, now, then what will happen is if somebody, if this was happening, let's say somebody bought a guitar in the 1930s and then they're trying to keep the guitar going through the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. They used to file down the bridge, file down the bridge. And you get to the point where the, you can't file down the bridge anymore. And this for me is the number one thing to look out for. I'd say if you're buying an old national, for me, the number one red flag that is going to cost a lot of money to fix is that the strings, well, the bridge, is completely filed down about as much as it can possibly go and that the strings are practically touching the metal body. 
that should not be the case. What should happen is the strings should come out of the tailpiece. Uh, they should come to about a 13 to about a 17 degree angle and come over the top and the strings, you know, I like them to be about three millimeters at the 12th fret, whatever that works out in, in inches in America, I can't quite remember now, but about three millimeters. Um, that's, that's the setup I'd look for. So if you ever see, and, and there you, you normally have quite a tall bridge to get that, to get that, that neck, to get that, uh, that break angle over the bridge, and then to get the kind of the strings at the right height at the 12th fret, because the, the neck is at the right angle, the neck's down. So this is where like the repair can be quite expensive. If, if you see that flattened, if you, if you see the strings touching the body, that very low saddle, there's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done because in order to correct that, the guitar has a neck stick that, 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 that is attached to the neck that screws to the body. All this has to come out. The fretboard more than likely has to come off. That neck will need planing flat. Often they'll put carbon fiber rods inside to strengthen the neck, to stop it pulling back. They'll, they'll plane it flat, put the fretboard back on, and then you've got to sort of reseat, you've got to recut where the neck touches the body and get all those angles right. And that's expensive, high-end work to do. Um, so I have seen old nationals uh, that have been left for 40, 50 years and they come out the case and they basically play fine. I've, it, it, of course it's possible. Of course it happens. But in the vast, 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 vast majority of cases, you know, the, the next the neck's basically done this and the strings are really high off the fretboard, e even when they're filed down on the bridge. And that's what you need to sort of look out for. So, so there's some issues to look out for in terms of the earlier necks. Now, one of the other issues about national guitars, those early necks, those 26 through to about 34 necks, they have flat fretboards and very, very, very small frets. If you were to see my, um, the frets on my Triolian, they're tiny frets, it's a flat fretboard. When I first got this guitar and brought it home to play it, I, if I'm honest, I struggled. I was used to playing you know, guitars with a, a radius fretboard on like my Stratocasters and my Martin Acoustics. Bends are easy. Also, it's quite easy to push that because your hands sort of automatically do that. It's quite easy to, to make chords on those guitars. When you get a flat fretboard, it's a little bit difficult. You've got to be, you know, I was getting a lot of weird buzzy noises because I wasn't fretting right. It took me a while to get into it. I actually like playing these original guitars now because it makes me think, you know, it puts me in the headspace of exactly how, say, Blind Boy Fuller was thinking, you know, at the time. And I'm used to it now. But I, I say that to warn you, you know, um, if you go for anything, 27 through to about 34, tiny little frets, flat fretboard. So even if you get the thing dialed in to play, just bear in mind that that's, that might be okay for bottleneck. But if you're somebody who's used to doing more like the kind of finger style blues, you might struggle with that, you know? So just bear that in mind. And then do you wanna be somebody who puts bigger frets in? Do the fret job on a, one of these old maple fretboards. You, you'll sort of, as you're pulling the old frets out, you can be sort of chipping the fretboard. Do you want to be responsible for that work? You know, you need to think about that. From 34 to about 42, National started making necks differently because they had trouble, even then they had trouble with guitars coming back for warranty repairs because those maple necks and those maple fretboards, dyed maple fretboards, the necks were starting to twist. So they did, invented a new way of doing the neck. Now this, this is a 35 Joelian. It has a three piece neck on it. So there's the neck and the grain of the wood goes this way. Then they put another little thin piece that's just about that thick with the grain going the other way on top as a sandwich and then the fretboard sits on top of that and they used to spray these necks now this one's had all the finish taken off but they used to sunburst these necks dark and very dark on the edge to cover where that three piece was now it does seem to stiffen the necks you still do get problems with them but what should be interesting to people that like a more modern feeling guitar is that these often these 35 onwards guitars they have a rosewood fret uh, they have a rosewood fretboard and they have a radius fingerboard with slightly bigger frets. So that should be something worth bearing in mind. Go, go 1935 onwards if you want that slightly more slinkier, easier sort of feeling neck. Okay then, so number three, 
we're going to look at cones. Now, of course, cones are sort of the beating heart of a resonator guitar, obviously. Um, and it's another place where there can be lots of issues. So, cones can fatigue, cones can sag. These guitars can have taken big hits at some point in the past and, and people have massaged the cones back to life. So you go and buy an all original or you buy an old national, you know, and, and you get it home and it doesn't sound right, it doesn't play right. You send it in for repair and when people take the thing off, they see that the cone's got splits in it, cracks in it, or it's been, like I say, it's been reshaped, but it doesn't sit right and it buzzes a bit because it's just all out of whack. This is something that can happen. Now, <clears throat> I, I genuinely believe, and, and, and I've spoken to practically all the world experts at these things, there's just some magic in, in a good old national with its original code. There's no doubt about it that there's some magic and some of the most magical, probably the most magical resonators are those ones. Um, so when you're buying a guitar, you might buy one with the original cone and it might sound thin, and it's just, that's that, the cone, that's the alloy, that's however it was spun on the day. But it might be in good condition. You might get one that's been massaged back to shape and it sounds incredible. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's such a hard thing to sort of quantify. But do watch out for it. So this one, uh, my old Duolian here that used to be gold. Um, when I bought this one, I took it in to have the full rebuild with Steve at Beltona Instruments. And, you know, typical Steve, he's, a, he's just a genius, an expert, and I'm not, you know, he took one look in the room, he said, oh, the cone's collapsing. I was like, oh, no, he said, it's original cone, but it's collapsing. I, I didn't know that, I just bought the guitar. And uh, this is, you know, something to think about, you know, I, I've been around these things enough now to know that when I buy one, every time I've bought an old resonator and I've taken it to Steve, what I thought was a good buy, he's pointed out problems because he's got much more experience than I have. And, and I just have to accept that. I have to change bits or things need sorting or it isn't what I thought it was. And that's just the way it is. So what Steve did was he, mass he, he massaged his cone, he kind of reshaped the cone and brought it back. And he said, you know what? Let's see if it works. So, you know, it's been like this in maybe about a year now and it hasn't collapsed any. I might get one more, two more. I might get 10 years out of it. This guitar sounds incredible. So I'd like to keep it for as long as possible. But you know what? If, if eventually that cone collapses again and the work he did kind of you know gets just it falls in again then in a heartbeat i'd put a new cone in to keep the guitar going would it sound as good maybe not maybe but do you know what if as well if i play it more a, a lot the cones do settle in you just have to keep it going and that's what you've got to kind of accept with these kind of things so watch out for cones that are collapsing expect to replace cones it's, you know, the way I feel about cones is a little bit like going back to the car analogy. Um, if you wanted to drive an old 1950s Porsche or something, you wouldn't have the same 1950s tyres on it. You, you couldn't expect that to work. Um, you need to put new tyres on it. Well, think about your resonator. That at some point, you probably need to put a new cone in it. One more thing about the cones, which is uh, the Dobro. I was looking for my Dobro. Uh, I've got an old Dobro here, which um, is a 30, I think it's a 38. This is going to go in for some work soon enough um, because it's not really optimum. It's probably giving out five or six tenths of what it should do. Now, when I took this to, to just get a quote on it, Steve looked at it and said the cone appears to have like collapsed to quite a degree. Apparently, that's much more common with old Dobros. Um, and... The general consensus seems to be that often with Dobros, you know, but with the Nationals, you might get away with keeping the cone for a very long time, the original cone. Dobros, that's less the case, just because of the nature of the build and, and, and the string pressure they can give way in time. So I'm not sure exactly, but um, watch out for that with Dobros. So at number four, it's um, bodies. And this 1929, Mandolin is a great example of things to watch out for. So many of the old national guitars um, have metal bodies and the, these are pieces of metal that are then soldered together and they do split. And it's 
a very difficult repair. So you'll probably see here that there is um, a split down the side. Now I went to buy this, this mandolin, played it, love the sound of it. I was offered it at a very, very, very good price. So I went, you know, I was very excited, snapped it up, got it home. Then I saw the split on it. Um, so it's okay. You know, th there's, there's ways of fixing that. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep this mandolin. Um, it also has another problem, which, which is that with old nationals, the tail pieces can often break. Now, mandolins famously always break. And this one is just on the, the verge of, of, of sort of hanging on. So, again, um, string pressure, metal fatigue, 80, 90, 100 years. These parts and the body seams can very easily come apart. They can be repaired. You can, you know, people can do, can put these back together, but you've got to be careful because if you're resoldering the heat, you, you, you can damage the paint, you can mar a nickel, shiny finish. So that's got to be done by experts. Sometimes people talk about using like dentistry, uh, welding equipment, you know, for doing like metal fillings and stuff and fixing these so it's pretty invisible, but it's very specialist work. If you want to keep one of these old guitars or these old you know, instruments original, then uh, you've got to go and find some people with some specialist gear and pay through the nose to get that fixed. The other thing to watch out for in terms of bodies, obviously, a lot of uh, ding, you can get a lot of dings. And often when you see like a ding or a dent on an old metal body guitar, there's usually a split that accompanies it because the whole thing kind of fatigues and goes. You know, another thing to think about in terms of old nationals and things to watch out for when buying. Um, if you think about the, the nickel finish nationals, so these shiny guitars, um, this one is pretty mint. This is a 1934 style guitar. Um, this, I polished this, and I did do a video about polishing, I'll put the link below. Um, but polishing these things is, you've got to be very careful because some products will, will lift the finish and, and get dirt out of the finish. Um, but you can wear away the nickel plating. So by and large, you want to be very, very gentle, use very, you know, very gentle products with these. Um, I've seen some old nationals. Uh, there was one recently, a square neck stylo that came up for sale for quite cheap. Um, but it must have sat in its case, and I dare say it must have sat in a cellar. Probably a cellar. Because, you know, a lot of the, um, around the tuners are, are greened. Um, and it had this kind of, you know, shiny nickel finish, but it was mottled. It was almost grey and mottled. Um, now, a slightly dull finish, you can, you can um, polish back. And then you can wax it so it doesn't get any more kind of dirt into it. Um, this this particular guitar uh, with the mottled dark grey, it, it actually stains. If you get leave moisture or water on these guitars, it kind of sucks into the nickel, gets into the brass underneath, and then it kind of things in the brass leach back out into the nickel, and it creates like a permanent like dark kind of stain in the nickel. You can't really get them out. You will polish and use products and you'll get, it will bring some of it out, but you'll never ever get rid of all of it. So I remember looking at that old um, square neck tricone and somebody was asking, would they be able to get it back? And it's, and I knew straight away, like no chance, no. So if you see one, which is, you know, a little bit marked, you know, a little bit dull, you'll be able to bring it back a little bit. If it's got actual, appears to be like dark, dark marks everywhere, that's it forever now. So number five, tuners. I, I I know players that the first thing they do when they get an old national is they take the tuners off and they get replica modern ones put on where all the, the holes and screw holes align. So these two triolians, my triolian and Toby's triolian that I'm just holding on to him this week, um, it's quite nice actually. So I found Toby this triolian and, and uh, the guy lives about an hour and a half from me in a, further in the north of England. And then Toby lives in the south of England. I'm playing a festival 
about an hour away from where Toby lives in the south of England next week. So I, I've been delivered this guitar and I'll deliver it to Toby. But yeah, Toby's has got the replica tuners on. I think the gear ratio is probably around 17 or 18 to 1. On the original Nationals, it's probably around, I don't know, probably 10 to 1, 12 to 1 maybe. The, the, the benefit of, though, of a higher ratio, like an 18 to 1, is when you're, when you're basically, the guitar's in tune and you're just tuning at the gig, those little micro tunes that you do, it's so much, so much more sort of fine control. Whereas with the older tuners, what you've got to kind of do is you, you kind of like, if you want to get in tune, if that's out of tune, say the low string's out of tune, you, what you actually have to do is go down and then go up to it. Because sometimes it, it's not quite fine enough just to bend up. You can sort of go too far. It's, it's sort of a weird sort of thing. But... So I know people that take the tuners off. I personally, you know, I've got this, this, this is a very original um, 31 Triolian. Um, it's got original tuners on. I don't want to take them off. I like it. any any old resonator that I get with original tuners. I'm I've never had a problem. Um, I know they can be worn out and they have to be replaced. And if that's the case, you know I compl completely understand that. So you know I think tuners like cones. You've got to accept that they're they're like the tires, you know, on the classic car of the resonator world, they're just not going to be there. And I don't really think it affects the value a, a great deal. Um, yeah. Okay, so last up, and it's uh, seven in its cases. So, um, you know, it, 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 if you're looking for something that's kind of more original and it's more of a collector's piece, then it's really nice. You know, let's say for an example, you bought a Triolian or a Duolian, one of the lower end models in, in, in the catalogue from the 30s. Sometimes they'll come with the original case and more than likely it'll be one of those cheap, um, card, what they used to call cardboard cases. They're very, you know, they're very thin, there's no padding. Often they've got that pretend like alligator skin finish on the outside and very like flimsy handles. Um, if you get one of those, they, they, they do have some worth, but they're not particularly worth anything but if you can just have the full set and you open it and you get the smell that's beautiful isn't it um occasionally you see old nationals with a hard shell case because cases were sold separately um i think people often used to plumb for the cheaper cases this guitar came with its original hard shell case a very nice quality case i've seen a lot of tricones old tricones that came with a, an original hard shell case because they were very expensive instruments. So I guess the person that could afford a tricone would probably spend whatever it was back in the day. If it was, let's say it was 70 pounds or a hundred dollars in today's money to buy a cheap case, they might spend, you know, the um, 250 pounds or, you know, 300 dollars on a hard shell case if they could afford a better guitar. Um, so it's nice if you get the original things. If it, it comes back to what we said earlier, doesn't it, about originality or if you want to actually play the instrument. Um, if you want to gig an instrument, you don't want to be taking them out in a, certainly in a cardboard case. And even those hard shell cases, I don't know if they'd last so well being gigged once, twice, three, four, five times a week, at, you know, at 80 years old. So you'd probably want to put your guitar in a decent hard shell case, um, a Carlton case, um, we did do a video about national guitar cases. I'll put it in the links below. Any classical size guitar case will keep them safe. Well, look, I've rattled on loads there, but like I say, I want to just put all the information out there and for you to take what you need from this. And, you know, if you're looking at a specific guitar to look out for these flags, or if you're over the years buying different nationals, then different things I've said today, might be relevant. The next thing I'm going to do is kind of just for a little bit of fun. So here we go, we've got two 1931 National Trillions. Um, so they're basically the same guitar. There's been a few tweaks done. So let's just compare them. You choose your favourite, pop it in the comments, and then I'll reveal, well, I'll, I'll talk through some detail changes while you're doing that. Then at the end, I'll reveal which one is which. So here is guitar A. <laughs>
So here is guitar B. Okay then, so there was both guitars. Do pop your comments below, guitar A or guitar B. Now what I'm going to do now is just talk you through a few of these little changes, just so you can see what is typical on an old resonator. So here is my 31 trillion. It's all original. Um, it had a neck set done on it. And this is something that you can sometimes watch out for. The original fret markers are made out of this kind of like ivoroid plastic. The person replaced, when they did the next set, they put some little pearl markers in there. And it's one of those little things that kind of annoys me because obviously maybe you can't get that material anymore. They, they stopped making it. But um, yeah, um, otherwise it's all original, except for this has got a 1934 cone in it. So the guy that had it before me, the cone collapsed and he had, um, I think it was a, a 34, I think, I think it was a square neck, a Jewelian. He took the cone out of that and put it into this. Toby's 31 um, has got changed modern tuners, but the, the tuners that are made to look old. Um, the first thing I noticed with, with Toby's is that the neck width is probably slightly thinner than mine. And the neck is, is there's a bit more wood um, depth to the neck. I think this is more like a kind of a D shape whereas mine's more like a kind of C shape. Um, this one has got a replacement fingerboard. So all the work on this was done by Steve Evans, uh, 20 minutes away, who's built guitars for Eric Clapton and worked for Mark Knopfler. Um, this has got a replacement fingerboard and it's slightly radiused. It's got slightly, it's got much bigger, more modern frets on it. So the first thing I noticed with this guitar is it plays like butter, I mean, Compared to mine, it's so much easier to play. This one also has a replacement cone, and it's a Beltona cone. Now, I don't know, because I don't know the history too much of this guitar. I bought it from um, Jim from the Hokum Hot Shots. Well, I didn't buy it. I collected it from Jim from the Hokum Hot Shots. Uh, Jim Murray, good guy. Um, so I, I can't remember. But put it this way, anybody that's into old nationals, nobody is getting rid of an original old national cone unless there's a flipping good reason to do it. So the fact that this has a Beltona cone in it, um, something must have happened, maybe the cone had collapsed, maybe it had a hit, maybe it had split around the edge, maybe it just sounded really thin and tight and brittle, I don't know. So that's a change thing. It has a strap button added, which is something you will often see. I'm looking for those, we, we mentioned splits earlier, early to watch out for splits. Sometimes you can feel splits, you feel like, like a little sharp edge starting to appear. There's nothing starting to appear there, so the, the seams are tight on that. Um, it's also got a moon that's been inlaid on the headstock on it. And the other thing it's got is a replaced decal. So the original decal must have come off. And it's had like a replica one put on. And um, yeah, so I mean, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Oh, and the other thing as well, this has got a pickup in it. So this is a, um, what's called a Highlander pickup. Now, Highlander pickups are the most authentic and decent sounding acoustic resonator pickups. Sadly, the couple that were running Highlander retired and nobody took over the business. So you can't get Highlanders anymore. So ironically, this pickup could, you know, hard to come by, people want them, um, could be taken out, could be sold on, I'd keep it. Um, so yeah, so what you do is you, uh, what a lot of people do is they, they put the jack output, they use these holes so you don't have to drill the guitar, so that could come off and not leave any mess. So there we go. This is a really good example of a guitar that is absolutely dialed in for playing. Um, it's a cool old guitar, but it's had, I would say, a lot of the right modifications done. Um, so, if we say for the sake of argument that a mint top-of-the-line one 
you know, really, I mean, mine's not mint, but let's just say a mint one was worth, let's say £4,000. So that's about roughly $5,000 in 2020, 2022 model. Then because this guitar has got changed parts, it sort of should be worth less. And because it's got paint missing and bits added to the back of the headstock, it should be worth less. Um, you know, and you pay less for it. But the work has been done by Steve Evans to make it play. And this is where I reveal now. I mean, this this was guitar B, and it was my 31 trillion that was guitar A. And I told Toby today, I got this guitar out of the case today, and I, I messaged Toby, I said, hey, yours sounds so much better than mine. I don't know what comes across on YouTube. It compresses everything, so it all sounds quite similar. But this guitar is considerably louder, broader sounding in every way. And that change fretboard with that radius and those higher frets and the actions really i mean flipping out you barely have to press at the 12th fret to get the to get the string down this is a great guitar this is a real cannon of a resonator and um you know what i hope all this information adds up to help anybody out there go out and buy an old resonator that's ready to go or negotiate a fair price to get the work done. And to also understand the reality of what you're looking at. If you want something all original, brilliant. But if you want to play something and gig, gig something, an all original 1931, 32 national might not quite have what it takes, you know. And then you might get into other kinds of things, you know, so. You know, when I play with Lead City Stompers, my trio, and Washboard Resonators, my duo, I use my new National Resophonic guitars. Bear in mind that National Resophonic is a separate company from National, the old original National that went out of business in 1942. Um, when I gig solo, I use different a different tuning. So I have this old 35 guitar um, with original comb, Finish was stripped off. I put a pickup in it. It's got the original fret, the original fretboard. I gig this guitar, never had a problem with it. So it is possible to use an old guitar, but bear in mind that this is one of those later necks with the, the, the radius fingerboard and the bigger frets. I have no problem gigging this because of the condition. I have no issue whatsoever. Um, you know what? And I have actually done unplugged gigs and recording sessions just using this, and no problem with that as well. Um, you know, under those conditions. But this is this. Th these are all things that you, as a player, have to decide um, where that line is and where you want to be. So, heck, that is so long-winded, and I'm so sorry for uh, going on so much, but I just wanted to share this, and I hope it helps. So, uh, thank you very much, everybody. My name is Martin. The band is The Washboard Resonators. Do like, subscribe. Do comment, it helps us. Do join the mailing list. And um, if there's anything else you want to know about nationals and resonators, do leave it in the comments because um, I'm just making a list of new video ideas and I'd love to get some more ideas for things I can do. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye for now.